David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. David was excited about worship, excited what he wanted to do, and excited to go to the tabernacle during his time, worship the Lord in spirit and truth. I want to thank you for tuning in this morning to the First United Methodist Church of Interlochen. I am Pastor Dave Miller, and I'm so glad you're with us. Thank you for taking your time to view this on the computer, on your tablet, whatever device you're using. And I do pray that the Word of God would encourage your souls. Sometimes I have people tell me, Dave, I want to have more faith than I do. Sometimes I'm full of doubts. Well, Scripture says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the more you read the Word of God, the more you hear the Word of God, the more you listen to different preaching, the greater your faith will grow as you spend time in the Word and spend time with Jesus. So let's open up now in a word of prayer before we go into our message. Father, thank you for this bright new day. Thank you for your presence which dwells with us. Thank you for the promise of Jesus that you will never leave us or forsake us that you're always with us, and for the promise, Father, wherever two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Thank you for your presence, your power, and your purpose for us. And help us now, Father, enlighten our eyes, open our hearts, as we look into the Word of God. We look to you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. Folks, I am going to be coming today out of Psalm 19. So if you'd like to follow along with me with your Bible at home, if you would turn to Psalm 19. And we're going to take a thorough look at Psalm 19 this morning. And I have the New International Version, very readable Bible. You might have a different translation, but it'll probably read very similar. Psalm 19. Folks, have you ever thought how many times we take things for granted? You might have to go grocery shopping one day, so you get up and you get dressed. Maybe you have a little breakfast. You get into your car, you drive down to Hitchcock's or Publix or Winn-Dixie, wherever you might go. You shop and get your groceries. You come home, you put everything away, and you sit down to rest. You ever thought what you perhaps might have taken for granted? Well, the psalmist didn't do that sometimes. And if you look in verse 1 of Psalm 19, you'll say he tells us, you can see first in the scoop description that this is a psalm of David, written by King David. He says in verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. You know, it's interesting. Theologians talk about revelation, how God reveals himself. And they talk about natural revelation, how God has revealed himself to us through nature, and then they talk about special revelation, which is the written word of God, the scriptures, the Bible that you and I so gratefully hold in our hands. So there's natural revelations here in verses 1 through 6, and then verses 7 through 11, we have special revelation, and then you see a confession beginning in verse 12. So the first thing we want to look at is natural revelation. David says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Sometimes just stop on a bright sunny day and look up and see how bright blue the sky is. The cloud formations that you can see with the moisture that's up there in the air. And remember that all those things really declare the glory of God. You might ask me, well, what does the word glory actually mean? Well, if you look at the Hebrew word kavod, the word really means something that's important, something that's heavy, something that is very, very weightier, weightier. So you could translate this first, the heavens declare the importance of God. The revelation of their creation is a revelation of God's existence to us. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Then he goes on in verse 2, and he says, Day after day they pour forth speech, Night after night, they display knowledge. Then he says, there is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. 
You know, creation very much is a silent witness to the fact that there is a creator, that all these things came into existence by God's creative hand. A man living over in China can look up into the Chinese sky at night, and in his Chinese language, he can understand that God exists. A Russian living over in Russia can look up at night at the stars and the constellations and realize in his Russian language that it speaks to him because it's a silent witness to the creative power of God. Apostle Paul even says in Romans chapter 1 that the visible things we can see are evidence of God, of his eternal power and Godhead, so that people are without excuse that do not believe in God. There's another psalm that says, A fool is the man who says in his heart, There is no God. And clearly the skies and the heavens, like it says, proclaim the work of his hands. Day and night, they give all out speech. The beauty of stars, the beauty of constellations, and if you've ever Googled, perhaps sometime, take a look at the Hubble telescope and some of the images that the Hubble, con uh, Hubble telescope is sending forth of different things that are way out in space with different galaxies and different colors that are out there. I guarantee you it will really amaze you. And sometimes we just go about our day, and go about the mundane duties we have to accomplish, and we don't take the time to stop and smell the roses and see how beautiful the sky and creation and nature really are. Verse 5 says, or actually verse 4, it says, In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, and like a champion rejoicing to run its course. You know, I was fortunate enough when I went to Bible college back in 1976, when I started out as a sophomore there, the Bible college I went to was right on the beach in Hollywood, Florida. In fact, it was the old Hollywood Beach Hotel that the Bible college had purchased and it turned into a school. And I paid $64 a month to have an oceanfront view. Would you like to be able to pay that today? to rent a condo or to rent an apartment on the beach for $64 a day. But every morning, my roommate and I could see the sun as it rose up out of the sea, the different colors, the pinks, the purples, the beautiful shades we would see. And then growing up on the west coast of Florida when I was younger, we would go down to Clearwater Beach all the time to swim. And we would stay there as a family until we see the sun gradually going down into the sea there at the Gulf of Mexico. And that sun is such a beautiful witness to the creative power of God. 93 million miles away. If we were any closer to the sun in our orbit, we'd burn up and human life would not be possible. If we were any further away from the sun, we would freeze out and all become icicles because there would be not enough heat to sustain life here on this earth. But God has put the sun just far enough away and the earth created to sustain the life we enjoy. I like the figure of speech he uses here, where he says, In the heavens he's pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion. Men, do you remember the day you were married? Perhaps you rented a tuxedo or you had on your best suit. You made sure your fingernails were trimmed, your shoes were shined, you had the cleanest shave perhaps you ever had, you had a fresh haircut. You looked as good as you possibly could look. You checked every nook, every cranny, you made sure everything was smooth because that was your wedding day and you were going to come out to meet your bride. The sun is that exact kind of figure of speech coming forth in such power. And then he says, like a champion rejoicing to run its course. It rises at one end of the heavens, it makes its circuit and to the other, and nothing is hidden from its heat. So in the area of natural revelation and what God's created, God points us to the skies, the atmosphere, the stars, the sun, all these things that he's created to show witness that he is there. If you and I were to take a hike through the woods and we were to come across a Rolex watch that we would find out there in the woods that somebody had lost, we would pick up that watch and look at its complexity and how it works, and we'd say, look at this watch. There has to have been a watchmaker. And sure enough, it would say Rolex or Timex or something like that on it. And you know it had 
a watchmaker. We see the beauty of creation. There has to be a creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now here at the next verse, verse 7, David shifts from talking about natural creation to special revelation when he talks about what God has given us in his word. Notice he switches from saying God in verse 1 to the word Lord here in verse 7. God's proper name, Yahweh or Jehovah. It's all capitals there in the word Lord, symbolizing that as God's proper name. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Do you need power? Do you need strength? Do you need a personal revival? The law of the Lord is perfect, and it'll be something that can revive your soul. I can remember when I was young, my family attended a Baptist church, and once or twice a year, they would have revival week, where they would bring in a special preacher to speak, he would be there every night of the week, and it was called Revival Week. So you had to go to church every night of the week if you were going to be faithful and take part in the revival. They used to bring in a different pastor or an evangelist from another church. He'd be up there screaming and hollering and pounding the pulpit in a traditional Baptist style. His face would be as red as the red lobster sign, and you could see the veins popping out of his neck. And he would beat you up one side of the wall and down the other, tell you that you robbed God and tithes and offerings, that you should be doing this, you should be doing that. And when you were done, you felt like you'd been whipped up and scolded so bad, and as you're walking out the door, you hear somebody say, man, that was really a good sermon. I felt more beat up than anything. And I think the Word of God talks about reviving. It's the idea of bringing fresh life new life into you, not necessarily beating you up or scolding you. There's a beautiful hymn in the Celebration Hymnal, hymn number 433, I'd like to share with you. It says, We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. Now listen to this last, last chorus. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. I think God wants to revive us. His word will do that very thing. His word is complete or perfect, and it can revive your soul and pick you up when you need that shot of medicine you need to keep on going on. Notice, secondly, he says, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. I can learn to be a wise person as I study the word of God. You know, one thing scripture has helped me in my life to do is to learn what not to do by different examples that it shows. You can see how people will live a certain way and make mistakes, and how God will come down and judge them and render to them according to the fruit of their doings. You see how somebody, one of these kings in the Old Testament, does dumb things and winds up getting judged for it. You and I don't have to learn every single thing for ourselves. We can learn through the examples of others. And studying the Old Testament, studying the life of Jesus and the apostles, we can find that we'll be wiser people living according to a higher standard because God's statutes are trustworthy and make us wise. Not only can they revive us, but they can make us wise. Then he goes on in verse 8 and says, The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. We just finished a long series on the book of Philippians. We talked about how Paul was so full of joy. I believe it's tucked away back in the book of Nehemiah, where Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord 
is my strength. And when you know you're doing what's right, when you know you're honoring the Lord, when you know you're trying to live as possibly as much as you can for God, it's going to bring a sense of joy to your life. The most joyous, peaceful, and contented people that I've ever known are people that have that close walk with God each and every day. Truly, the joy of the Lord is our strength. He goes on nextly and says, The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Remember the song, Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Now we understand life for what it truly is. Our eyes have been opened. We understand why life is what it is and why things happen. We understand the truth about God made a perfect created world and created Adam and Eve to live in that world. Because of their sin and disobedience, sin came into the world and death through sin. We understand why we grow older and die because of the effects of sin on the fall of man and on the planet. We understand why there's wars and contention and strife because of sinfulness and people going away from the laws of God. Our eyes are enlightened to understand life for what it truly is. And in my opinion, the Bible is the best explanation of life on this planet as we know it and see it. Its truths have stood the test of time. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And the ordinance of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. He talks about the law, the statutes, the precepts, the commands, the fear of the Lord and his ordinances, and all these things that can revive our soul, make us wise, give joy to our heart, make us a whole lot be able to see clearer than we ever had before. And then the ultimate value of the word is what he says in verse 10. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. You know, gold is something, and silver is something also, precious metals that don't lose their value. Their value is, is, is forever because people have always valued gold and silver, even above paper currency. The value of paper currency can go down and rise, but gold and silver always maintain their value. But you know what's sad? You can go and read studies of different lottery winners, people that have won millions of dollars, and find out because they weren't that wise on how they handled their affairs, they went through that money like a hot knife through butter. I remember years ago, I had a new inmate come into the institution at Putnam CI, and he was one of the original members of the rock group Cool and the Gang. I know many of you are familiar probably with Cool and the Gang as they sang different songs on the radio, a different rock group. And I asked him if he had any money left of all the money he had made out there traveling. And he said, Chaplain, I don't have a dime. You're out there living that fast life. The money comes fast and it goes fast. I don't have a dime without any of that money. It's all gone. And I thought, wow. Truly the word is a whole lot more powerful because it's going to last. And the psalmist realized it's more precious than gold more precious than anything else. Also sweeter than honey from the comb. So sweet because it gives you life. It gives you freshness. I don't know about you, but I think a lot of you are probably like me. Don't you love sweet? Sweets, cake, pie, ice cream, all those good things that are sweet. I love coffee, ice cream, whipping it up and making it soft and eating it. That sweetness to your thing. The word of God is sweeter than honey Honey from the honeycomb. And look at verse 11. By them is your servant warned. Now look closely here. In keeping them, there is great reward. Let me repeat that. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is a great reward. Would you like to be rewarded? Would you like to see blessings come your way? God says you can do it here by keeping his commandments. Over in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 6, it says, He that comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. I remember growing up as a boy watching the old westerns and all those old western TV shows and those old western movies. There were always people that were wanted by the law. 
and you would see a wanted poster up on the wall with a guy's picture on it, and it would say, wanted, dead or alive. And you had bounty hunters that wanted to get the reward for bringing in that criminal. There was a show called Have Gun, Will Travel, and that was a bounty hunter, a guy that played that, and he would go around trying to get that reward money. God offers us a reward if we will diligently seek him now. And here it says, in keeping them, there is what? Great reward. Not only some reward, but great reward. So stay in the word of God, obey the word of God, let the word of God revive your soul, and you'll find that great reward that God has for you. Sometimes it might be material. Sometimes it might be spiritual. Sometimes it might be just an overall sense of peace and contentment that you haven't experienced before. But God can give that to you if you manage to obey and keep his commands. After talking about natural revelation, creation, the skies and the sun and the heavens, and then after talking about special revelation, the word of God and the power it can have, the psalmist here turns to a time of confession in verse 12. He says, who can discern his errors? The implication we really can't. Forgive my hidden faults. You know, I think if all of us are honest, we probably have faults that aren't that acknowledged by us too much. It might be hidden faults. Other people might be able to see it. Perhaps a friend or your spouse, your husband or your wife, and you have a fault, but you really can't see it. It's a hidden fault. He's asking there, right there, to keep me, Lord, uh, forgive my hidden faults. We'll never be perfect in this life. We can get better and better each day, but we'll never reach sinless perfection. Keep your servant also from willful sins. Lord, when temptation comes, don't let me make that choice to willfully sin. Keep me back, Lord. Help me to think, stop, and think before I do these things. And if I have my hidden faults forgiven, and if I'm kept from willful sins, then will I be blameless and innocent of great transgression. So he asks for forgiveness when he realizes the power of God in the created order, the power of God in the word of God with being revived again. And then the last words is a prayer here in verse 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. What I say and what I think about. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Folks, it's so important to really watch what words we say, to put a guard on our mouth, and always to speak something that's going to build somebody up, encourage somebody, compliment somebody, and make sure we're an avenue of blessing to somebody instead of somebody that's always running somebody down. And we know people that are that way and how they're so hard to be around. Remember the old thing in elementary school? Sticks and stones could break my bones, but names will never hurt me. We tried to say that to comfort ourselves, but didn't the names hurt us? Didn't those words hurt us as kids? And we learned over time not to speak that way and not to tease people excessively or anything like that. So something we need to think about, what we say and what we think about. May my words in my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. What is a rock? Something that's permanent, something that does not change. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change. He's our rock, but also he's our redeemer. And that's really what the cross is all about. God loved you and I so much that he sent his only son to this earth, Jesus lived a perfect life, and then when he died on the cross, he took your sins and my sins upon himself and made a complete and full payment that you might be redeemed, being bought with the price of his blood, and come in to his family. Not only is he your rock, something will never change, but he's your redeemer, and now you belong to him. So trust him. So learn not to take things for granted. Stop and smell the roses. Stop on a bright sunny day and look at the cloud formations and see if you can see any Disney characters up there. 
Every now and then I think I see Mickey Mouse and different things like that in the clouds. Go out on a cool night, especially when it gets cold during the winter and there's the dry, cold air that's in, and see the beauty of the stars on a cold winter night. Realize what all things are around us that all point to the Lord. And then go get into the Word of God and realize He can revive you again. Like that beautiful hymn sings, revive us again. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Lord, revive us again. And when we're revived, when we're filled with the Spirit, we'll be the people that God would have us today. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the beauty of the words of David, the words of creation, and the words of special revelation through the Scripture. And I do pray, Father, we would find the joy that is in your word. Father, you tell us right here, clear as a bell, that in keeping your ordinances, there is great reward. Help us to truly find you, to seek you, to search with you with all of our heart, that we might find the rewards that you promised for us. For it is not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. We look to you, Father. In Christ's name, amen. Folks, thank you for being with us this morning. I hope this psalm and the explanation of it has been a blessing to you, and I encourage you to read back through it this week. Spend time in the Word of God. Again, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The more time in the book, the more you'll grow, the closer you'll get, and you'll find the peace that God promises. That peace that passes all understanding, just like Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 4. Thank you and have a very blessed week. Lord be with you. Amen.